G'day everyone, I'm Smokescreen and welcome back to another video and welcome to a little bit of an experimental video today. I'm trying to make a video on one of the GT Cafe menu books. We're going to jump into the World Touring Car 600 menu book, so that's a championship we have to finish in the top three of, as Luca kindly uh, tells us there. It also means we're going to be competing internationally. Thank you, Luca. Uh, so we're going to go over to the World Circuits, the championships along the bottom, and we see the WTC 600. We're going to see all of the cars that are eligible to use. So you can pretty much use any road car underneath, or any car underneath 600 performance points. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about the Intenza, there may be the M3, but uh, I decide that I'm going to go with a four-wheel drive car because I also happen to know, I happen to know that one of the races is in the wet weather. So we're going to sort by drivetrain, head down to the four-wheel drives and sort of pick from the bunch. The Mazda Tenza is there and then I'll have the Porsche Taycan looking at me with 601 performance points. So we're going to jump in that and off to the tuning shop we go to get this car up to race standard. First things first, carbon ceramic brakes and a brake balance controller and racing brake pads. So plenty of stopping power here. I was going to put the sports suspension on, but I'm like, nah, I'll do the fully customizable. Nope, 23 grand. We're going to go the one step down and go the height adjustable suspension. Sports soft tires. I'm going to put the ballast in in case we need to use some of that to get this car eligible. Power restrictor for the same reason. Fully customizable computer for the same reason, so we can adjust pretty much everything. So we're just going through and seeing what else there is to buy. There's not really too much else. A lot of it is uh, not applicable because it's an electric car. Well, that's the tuning done. So let's go over to uh, the customized car in GT Auto and get this looking the part. So we're going to chuck a rear wing on the back here. Um, sort of <laughs> look at that that high rear wing looked ridiculous. I'm going to go a little bit conservative here and start with the small wing set, putting the end plates on. I like the way these ones look. I feel like they'd be sort of they, they sort of go with an electric car. We'll put the little carbon uh, front lip spoiler on the front as well. Let's get a colour. Plenty of colours to choose from. I have to buy the colours, of course. I eventually settle with this dark blue, which we're now going to put on the car in form of a livery. So uh, it's not as simple as you just change the colour of the car. You've actually got to create a livery. So I guess that gets my livery count up a little bit. So we're going to chuck the, the uh, dark blue we just purchased. We're going to put the white wing mirrors on too to go with the white trim inside the wheels. I'm going to give a black rear wing and now we're going to put the stickers on the car get them ready for racing I'm going to put the number 89 on there as well I'll do that in just a second I'm going to try and claim the number 89 to be my race number so there we go let's may as well start it here let's put the windshield banner on as well because what's a race car without a windshield banner we're going to go with the white oh, we're going to go with the black text on the white put my race name on the roof and that's looking absolutely beautiful. I think I decided I wanted to invert the colours on the race banner, make it look a little bit more low-key, and we've got to save that as the Porsche race car. Apply the design, and that's us. Gone skis out of GT Auto. The car is looking absolutely beautiful, but now we have to adjust the car settings. We actually have to use all these parts we've just purchased and make it into an eligible race car below 600 performance points. So first off, we add a bit of rake. So we raise the rear ride height, drop the front ride height. Now we're going to mess with the output adjustment of the ECU, the fully customized, fully customizable ECU that we purchased. We're going to settle for something near 600. We've got ourselves to 600.24. We're going to put some ballast in to try and sort of uh, get that just underneath. We're underneath there. There we go. We have 599.97. Uh, but I wanted to see if I could get it dead on 600. Uh, I forgot to raise the downforce. We're going to do that now. And that, of course, is going to muck with the... Uh, performance points a little bit so we're just going to decrease the ballast now see how close we can get this I was just mucking around and I realized no it's an electric car I don't want to add any weight at all so I dropped the ballast to zero and I'm just going to do all of the performance points adjustment with simply the fully customizable ECU and we finally get ourselves to about 598 or well, thereabout. So here we go into the championship. Let's go. First race, Red Bull ring in the wet. Uh, so this is why I wanted the four-wheel drive car. We're going to be just be using the sports soft tyres. We're not actually going to be on any racing set of tyres, mainly because I wanted 
I, I don't want to just have an easy victory, like 20 seconds in the lead. I don't really want that. So I'm going to give the road cars the sports tyres they deserve. Sports Soft, the grippiest set of road tyres you can get in this game. And, of course, we've got the four-wheel drive capability of this Porsche Taycan Turbo, which is really, really useful in the wet weather because we can just plant our foot and off the car goes. We don't have to worry a bit too much about the oversteer nature as we send it up the inside of Kenny Konomos driving the... Jaguar F-Type, straight off the track we go, so at least we know for next time we're going to have to break slightly earlier than that. We out-drag him out of the corner as well. Plenty of rain on the radar, as you can see down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Plenty of rain on the horizon, so we're just going to have to hang out for this wet weather at the moment. But one thing to note is that the uh, level of moisture on the track, as seen on the bottom left of your screen, the little uh, indicator right next to the tyres, it's not 100% waterlogged just yet. We're still sort of around about a third, heading up towards a half of the track uh, wetness. <laughs> a bit of a strange way of saying it. Down the inside of Randall Haywood and Martin Grady. We're catching up to this person in the Aston Martin DB11. I don't quite recognise that name, unfortunately. Takeda driving the DB11. Heading down towards the final two corners. We're breaking sort of as we were at the pre at this opening of the lap in the track, as you can see, with the wetness indicator on the bottom left, has gone to the maximum amount of wetness you can go before aquaplaning. So the track is truly soaking wet now, and that's happened very quickly. So this back end of the circuit is a little bit wetter than the front half, at least on turn one. We managed to get that under control, so we're going to have to watch our braking up into turn one now. We're going to be quite gentle on the brakes, not even using 100% braking for most of that braking phase there. Get it stopped for turn one, try and get the power down on the exit. The car still does a little bit of a wiggle, despite the fact it's four-wheel drive. And by the time we get the end of this straight through turn two, up the inside of Danny Solis and Baptiste Beauvoir, and we're faced with the back of Patrick Blagin driving his uh, Porsche 911. We outdrag the Mercedes AMG straight out of turn three. That's probably the four wheel drive nature of my Porsche Taycan compared to the rear wheel drive nature of that AMG GT. That comes into great effect straight down the outside of Blajan, the inside of Yamanaka into turn four. Absolutely beautiful. A nice little double move there. Now we're going to be trying to get the power down as we head through turn five. The car does want to spin out, but I'd imagine Yamanaka in that rear wheel drive super is going to be having a much tougher time getting his accelerator up to 100% input uh, compared to me who I can sort of rely on the four-wheel driveness there you go there's the word of the day four-wheel driveness of the Porsche Taycan we've got an R34 is that an R34 Nissan GTR I don't know the Nissan GTR Nismo is all that comes up on the screen when I go past it so we're not going to bother giving it its R designation for fear of getting it wrong and triggering all the Nissan fanboys uh, but we managed to out drag him uh, that's Adam Suswillow coming out of turn eight, down towards the final couple of corners. The rain has just passed us now, so the track's gonna be drying up. We still have to be really careful. The track remains wet for quite a while uh, yet. It's probably gonna be about another lap until we can start returning to previous braking points. Down through the final turn, nice and slow to not run too wide off the exit or spin out. And that is absolutely beautiful through the final couple of corners. The rain, it doesn't look like there's any more on the way. So as for right now, we can just focus on this drying line because that's going to be the most important thing. That's going to... Oh, no, up the inside of two cars there, up the inside of Cockerbone and trying to get this move done on his owl, but he gets the better drag out of the, out of the corner as well. He tries to go to the out side but I switched to the left hand side of him and I managed to drag past both Hazel and Igor Fraga driving his Toyota Supra up towards turn three where are we breaking on this drying surface we're going to be taking a little bit conservative I think oh we almost looked to go up the back of Gallo oh my goodness that was a little bit of a moment there and I sort of get a little bit caught on that apex there and Gallo ends up sort of re-overtaking me I out drag everyone who's backed up at turn three so I don't have to stress too much we're going to have a look at getting closer to Gallo once again heading into turn four this time we managed to get that stopped absolutely beautifully on the wet track actually but Gallo gets a little bit of a better exit compared to me I think perhaps Gallo finding a little bit more grip there compared to me I'm still you know quite worried about spinning out but as we head into this middle sector section sector I tried to say both words at the same time 
that drying line is just starting to form there as we head out onto the middle of the track. That wetness indicator on the bottom left has just gone down to the bottom third and you can hear the tyre noise has changed. It's gone to much more of a traditional tyre scrub noise than sort of the wet squeegee noise we get when the track is fully waterlogged. So that tells me the track's reached the stage where we can start pushing the braking points and carrying more speed through the corners there. The kerbs are still quite wet though. As you can see we run wide off the track there because we took the middle kerb on the apex and and once again back out onto the drawing line on the tarmac and that wetness indicator is a much more manageable level so we're pushing the braking point a little bit more we used 100% braking for quite a bit we got this stopped absolutely beautifully got it stopped on a dime heading through turn five and that gives us the look at Miyazono which is the last car of this particular race that we have to overtake look down the inside at turn six it's not quite going to happen on that time so still just hanging behind Miyazono we're just going to be looking to get a move maybe into one of the corners because that's something I've noticed about the AI here these are all AI cars of course is that they don't quite maximize the braking points at every single corner like you can as the player so right up the back of Miyazono now we're going to be looking down the inside he's going to change a gear and look at me in my electric car I don't have to change any gears whatsoever and I'm able to just accelerate through the point where Miyazono has to shift gear and he looks like he was coming back at me through uh, the second to last corner but as we round turn 10 uh, that's Miyazono behind us. We're just going to be getting the power down in the straight line using the, the straight line prowess of the Porsche Taycan and the superior uh, corner exit grip as well. Coming into turn one, get a beautiful apex there and just power down on the exit as per usual. That dry line is definitely formed. You can see it at this stage. Uh, but then coming up towards the end of the lap as Miyazono dropped out of the slipstream, another little patch of rain, and that adds just enough water on the circuit to give me a little bit of trouble through this final sector, so I'm having to take it a little bit more carefully on this time. That rain has passed. It was literally a 15-second burst of rain, and that's just given the track a little bit of extra moisture such that I had to be careful, and you might have just seen for a split second in the bottom right of the screen, I lost two tenths in that last sector. So the rain takes effect pretty much instantly, uh, but for that particular race, we were able to come across the line in fourth, picking up the first trophy of the championship. But we're currently leading the championship, heading into the second race, the second race of three. We're going to be heading to Suzuka now, race two, still with our beautiful race prepped and ready Porsche Taycan. This is going to be an interesting one, actually, because Suzuka really rewards high handling ability, and I wouldn't exactly call a four-wheel drive, two-ton electric sports car uh, the gold standard in handling. So we're going to have to be really careful. We do still have the sports soft tyres, and there doesn't appear to be any rain to report of. Look at that lovely blue skies with just a little bit of scattered cloud. Uh, no chance of rain so far. Uh, that can of course change in a matter of a lap or so so we have to keep an eye on it because the uh, Suzuka does have the wet weather effects but as of right now it's not looking to be a huge threat. So we're just going to be threading the needle through this opening snake section. We got past two cars. We got past Gentry and Konamos driving uh, their cars respectively. That's the most obvious thing I've ever said. Uh, but looking up towards Randall Haywood driving the Lamborghini Huracan, I believe that car is straight down the inside at Degna 1. And that's how that one's done. Really aggressive move there. Martin Grady now. Tijni driving the Audi R8. Of course, we outdrag him on the exit of Degna 2. And that's us up into 12th on the start of lap one or in the first couple of sectors of lap one heading towards the hairpin. It's important to get it stopped and rotated here, which is not the easiest thing to do in the world, given how heavy this car is and given the four-wheel drive nature, it can be difficult to get this car turned. But heading through the long turn 12 at Suzuka, this long right-hander heading up towards Spoon. That's us in the slipstream of the DB11 who takes it quite slow on that last little bit straight into the braking zone there. And we actually touch the AstroTurf on the entry, so we're going to have to try and re-enter the track here without losing a position uh, to, Kati to Takeda behind. Oh, that was a little bit of a tongue twister for me. But out onto the back straight, we're up into 11th. We're going to fast forward here and see if we can get uh, 130R correct. Yeah, look at that understeer there. So we're d definitely going to have to break a little bit more for that corner. <laughs> we're going to have to watch out for that one and make sure we get it stopped into the chicane, taking the GT Sport uh, racing line through there, all over the tops of the kerbs. And that is a one lap 
lap of Suzuka. Turn one at full speed. Now we're going to use the 100 meter board and try and get it stopped in time. And it's actually not too bad. We managed to get it stopped for turn one. A little bit wide at turn two, but we sort of come back for the apex. And that's honestly not been a disaster there because we're right on the back of Danny Solis driving the Alfa Romeo 4C. We're going to be trying to get up the inside coming through turn four around the outside of turn five to complete the move. We've got Baptiste Beauvoir, Patrick Blagen, and Adam Sassuolo. The next three cars up the road around the outside of Beauvoir. And we've still got Blagen and Sassuolo uh, to take care of through this handling section. The handling section is not the best place to catch up to the AI cars because it'd be very easy to actually get stuck behind them. Straight up the inside of the Porsche. And we're going to try and... Oh, we're not quite close enough to get the dive at Degna 1 like we did on the Lamborghini at the out of the lap. The dive at Degna 2 is not quite going to happen as Sassuolo comes in for the apex. I have a little bit of a bobble on the exit and end up doing a Max Verstappen and running very wide at Degna 2. And let's see if we can get anything done at the hairpin. We brake very late using all of the brakes. We've got the carbon ceramic brakes and the racing brake pads fitted to the Porsche Taycan and we're able to use those to great effect and get up the inside of Adam Sassuolo at the hairpin. Let's see if we can get Spoon a little bit better this time. Learning from last time. No, we just nicked the Astro Turf halfway through. But we managed to keep it on the black stuff this time. So I guess you could call that an improvement. We get the uh, we get the better pace down the straight compared to Hazel in the Subaru 22B. Uh, was that the car? Subaru Impreza or something? We still run wide at 130 so We've still got some work to do there. Let's see if we can get this car stopped now. Absolutely perfect at the chicane. We cut the first one, cut the second one, just as we did in GT Sport. And honestly, that's one of my favorite corner cuts in the game because you can actually get away with it and it feels quite satisfying to do. We've caught up to Yamanaka now, of course. Once again, in the handling section, you can hardly write this stuff, but straight around the outside at turn five and we make very quick work of that Toyota Supra there. Really nothing too much to worry about. The next car up the road, Takuma Miyazono. I don't know what car he's driving but that's all good through that opening section look at that okay so it's a Subaru WRX and there's really no contest there I just straight up get past him down the down the flat out section I was going to say down the straight it's not really straight though is it Let's see. Spoon, let's get it right this time. Meet that first apex. Meet the kerb on the outside. Little bit of brakes. Come in for the second apex. Nice and tight on the entry. And then we can go a little bit wide on the exit. Or we get the power down on the exit. That's beautiful. And then we 130R. We get that right too. So a much better lap coming right up. And then coming into the chicane. Braking point just before the 100 meter. But oh no, that's really deep now. So we got took so much more speed through 130R that time. That we've actually uh, gone too deep at the chicane. So we're going to have to reset, redo another lap, and try and get that braking point correct this time. And that sort of put us a little bit behind the eight ball as it's taken about half a lap to try and recover that time we lost at the chicane there. And we've caught up to Va uh, Valerio Gallo now. Coming into the hairpin, we've shown that we can do a move at this part of the track before using the very powerful brakes installed on the car straight up the inside of the Honda NSX, nice and tight to the apex. And he's not able to actually keep the car around the outside there. So I've also got uh, the lip, the car carbon lip spoiler on the front and the rear wing on the back so that gives me a little bit more handling through the corners up behind Eagle Fraga now heading to 130R it's really not the best place because the dirty air effects can probably be a little bit detrimental but we just take it quite conservative actually don't even use a full width of the track and we get a better exit off there so it just goes to show you can be rewarded for taking it a little bit conservatively Fraga hangs it around the outside as someone outside races past in probably a similar car to the type that Eagle Fraga's in uh, but we managed to get Get the power down through the final turn we've got one more lap to catch 3.7 seconds up to Cockerbun. We get this close, eight tenths behind, coming out of Degna 2, so it's looking quite good to actually grab this position, potentially into Spoon, maybe. So let's see how this goes. We have to get a really good hairpin, make sure we get it stopped and rotated as per usual, and get on the power in one foul swoop. We sort of probably get on the power a little bit too early there, because we've gone a little bit wide on the exit, and Cockerbun gets a much better exit. We have better straight line speed, though, so I think at the moment we're seeing the uh, characteristics, uh, the dynamics characteristic of a power car up against a handling car. Cockerbun much better through the corners, but the Taycan much better down the straight. Let's see if we can take advantage of our advantage and drag race Cockerbun and get a 
uh, move into the breaking zone for the chicane. We've still got quite a bit to go. We're still seven tenths behind. It's going to have to be the absolute send of the century. We're going to have to nail 130R, which we indeed do. That's about four tenths behind him now. We're going to lock down the inside, break as late as I possibly dare because I don't want to crash off the track. Cockerbun doesn't take the cuts at the chicane. I try and take the cut, but it's not, not quite going to work. I'll just run into the rear left flank of Cockerbun, but I'll get a better launch out of the chicane. I'm going to take the shortest possible distance to the line. And it's only going to be a second. Oh, disaster. Absolute disaster stations. Nah, it's all good. As long as I continue to lead the championship, which I do uh, by a good number of points there. I lead the championship by about eight points coming into race three. I've just got to make sure uh, that I don't be, uh, that I don't get beaten again. Final race of the championship, Dragon Trail Seaside now, an absolute classic track in terms of Gran Turismo, now a classic modern circuit in Croatia, and we're going to be doing this at twilight, don't know if it's dawn or dusk, but whatever, it still looks beautiful. So, this uh, this lap is going to be pretty uh, pretty characteristic of a braking on time, getting, in, getting the chicanes perfect as we sort of slam it up the inside of, of Gentry, driving the Dodge Viper at the first chicane, so look at that, get a move done early doors. And once again, Kenny Konomos driving the Jaguar F-Type. He's still down in 14th, let's see if he can put up a fight. The answer is obviously gonna be no. Get straight around the outside at turn six, and there's gonna be no contest regarding that particular maneuver. But we've still got 28 seconds to catch the lead, Quite, uh, still quite the distance to go. But let's see if we can get any moves done through this middle handling section, which I, su which I uh, suspect the AI are going to be breaking so much more for. Let's see if we can get the better run out of the corner. Wide entry to get the power on the exit as Randall Haywood runs a little bit wide. Aston Martin DB11, we go to the right-hand side in case it picked up speed down the straight. I'll have the inside for the following hairpin. Let's make sure we get this breaking point right. We're going to start with the start of the kerb. Oh, that's a little bit deep. So we're going to have to break earlier next time we get around. That's the thing about these combinations. It's it's not something you can sort of practice and then jump into. You just jump into it. So you have to learn everything on the fly. First chicane of death of Gran Turismo 7. Do we get claimed? Is the chicane of death any better? No AI cars. Oh, look at that. Straight down the inside at the final part. Straight down the inside at turn 16. And we get pa uh, get past Patrick Blajan with no contest at all. Past two more cars. Swillow and Solis taken care of. Into the final turn. Are any of them going to come for a return manoeuvre as we leave the inside open for quite a while? to try and get a straighter exit for the main straight. Nobody is going to be able to come back at me. Turn one, we mess this up again and go too deep. By the time we've reached turn six, we're right on the back of Beauvoir now. And this is on the exit of a low speed corner where my four wheel drive uh, Taycan is going to be much better than this uh, AMG. So using the slipstream, oh, he's going to break through the little kink, which I wasn't ready for. And I get straight past him heading down into turn eight. And that is going to be absolutely no worries to keep this position. Let's keep the car on the track though, because that would be quite beneficial. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, so they're all going to say the same thing. Any racing driver will say that. And by the end of lap two, we've already caught up to Yamanaka through the chicane. Awkward spot to catch up to someone, but the gap on the exit opens up. Straight down the inside, we nail the first part of turn one, but the second part of, well, not turn one, the first chicane, but we mess up the second part anyway, so we've still got some work to do there. Kokobun and Miyazono go defensive, and that's going to open up the, the gap on the exit. We get we drag race straight down the outside of Miyazono, and looking at Kokobun, who breaks very early for the fast-flowing middle S's at Dragon Trail Seaside. You can see he's going to try and attempt to cut back there. He's looking around the outside with a slight bit of overlap, but he has to come out of the throttle as he has to get prepared to take the following corner. So that's going to be no contest from Kokobun either. We catch up to Eagle Fraga at one of the most awkward spots on the track to do it around the outside at the chicane of death. And we don't die. And we're still in the slipstream of Gallows. We've absolutely just dabbed on Eagle Fraga there. Get wrecked, mate. Slipstream of Valerio Gallo now coming into the final turn. So we've got a couple of options here. We can try and get past here, which we're going to try and do as we catch up a load of ground, accelerate the car up the gap that forms that he leaves on the inside, and because we've got better straight line speed here, or well, he's actually going to have the slipstream, which may prove to be a quite important factor uh, in what happens at turn one, but Gallo is actually going to have the legs on me down the straight, there's not too much I can do, the electric car is going to only have one acceleration, I suppose the, the petrol car is also going to have the same thing, but I suppose you don't have the 
you don't have the benefit of being in the right gear, being in a power band or whatever. I don't know. I don't really know what I'm talking about here. But we get past Valerio Gallo anyway. And we've only got one more car, Mikhail Hizal. And we've still got one lap to go. So this one's been quite easy compared to the one at Suzuka because we came onto the last lap at Suzuka and we still weren't even sort of within touching distance of the lead. But we're finishing up the penultimate lap and we're already in the lead uh, at the Dragon Trail race. So a little bit of an easier time. I think I gain a lot more time at the chicane of death. Oh, Hizal tries to go for the return move up the inside of the final turn that's not quite going to work so we've just got a drag race up the straight again he's not going to use the full effects of the slipstream i think the ai are kind of programmed to try and follow you and grab some slipstream but obviously they don't want to follow you right to the uh, track edge so that's maybe a little bit of a exploitable thing when you're racing the ai we finally nail turn one and that gap to hazel has opened up to about 1.2 1.3 seconds at this particular stage so it's going to be absolutely no worries up to the end where we cross the line with flying colors in first position and that's going to see us bring home the championship absolutely beautiful uh, so look at that porsche tycan beat a load of petrol cars just Try and tell me which one's better now. Ha ha ha. Oh dear, we beat that championship. We get the gold trophy. Absolutely beautiful. And oh, finally we get to pick the gift card. This is one of the one of the ways the car uh, the game gifts you. It gives you three, and then you just choose a random one. I always go the middle one and it worked out good this time. I won the BMW Z8, so we're gonna use that for the next menu. But back to the GT Cafe we go because I still need my personal validation from Luca. Uh, it's not gonna be worth it until Luca says congratulations. Okay, it's all been made worth it now. Absolutely beautiful. And I think we win Circuit de Barcelona Catalonia. Fantastic. But yeah, a uh, little bit of an experimental video today. I sort of never really thought of trying to make a video of the menu books, and I thought, oh, well, why not? Why in particular not? I couldn't really answer the question, so I thought, oh, well, we'll give it a try. So let me know if you enjoyed it, hit the like button if you did, and please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos and streams from me. Do leave a comment as well. Questions, comments, and constructive criticism, as always, very much appreciated. But that's going to finish up this video today, and that means that is it from me. So once again, I do thank you very much for watching. See you later.